pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. And as Brian said, I'll be talking about causographical models in system genetics. And this talk basically has three pieces to it. First part, I'm going to give some motivation and some basic concepts. The, the, the idea is to try to give some intuition about why is that when you actually integrate genetics together with other phenotypes, as for example, gene expression or uh, pro protein levels, things like that, we can actually get to causality. The, in the second part, I'll be talking about some causality tests, hypothesis tests to determine causality between pairs of phenotypes. And finally, in the third part of the talk, I'll be talking about causal Bayesian networks, and in particular, an algorithm that I developed that's called KTLNet. Okay. So, motivation and basic principles. So, suppose you have a gene, right? A gene G, and it's associated with a clinical phenotype C. Right. And you want to know whether is, is the gene has actually a causal effect in the phenotype. If it's the other way around, and the gene is simply reacting, reacting to variations in the level of the clinical phenotype. Or if they are simply associated and there is no causal relationship between them, uh, what can happen just because there is actually a latent variable that actually affects both phenotypes. Uh, so, but you want to distinguish between this, these models. And the problem is that you, just using data, you cannot really tell the difference between them. Because if, if you look here, we can write this model here. It, it actually factors as a marginal distribution for the gene expression times the, the conditional distribution of C given G. And this is actually, so the, the joint distribution of both phenotypes, you can factor in this way according to this model or you can factor in this way according to this model, or you just keep this way like according to this model. And it turns out that if you try, if you have a, a, a likelihood function for these models and you maximize it and you try to compare these scores, they are going to be exactly the same. And you cannot really tell the difference between these models. Right? However, if in addition to the phenotypes, it turns out that both of them map to, to, to a common QTL, you can actually use the QTL to, to, to get, to, to learn the causal ordering between these phenotypes here. Right. And this approach wa was pioneered by Eric Schatt in 2005. So it, it is a, a nature genetics paper. And it, uh, Schatt was working for me, Mark at the time. And this is, I mean, it's a very interesting for a, a, a drug company. They are all interesting. In, in determining which are the, the, the genes that actually have a causal effect on the phenotype, because these are actually the drugable targets that can, they can actually use to, to, to develop drugs. Whereas re reactive genes are not really very interesting. And so let me, but before that, let me just go through these models a little bit. So the reason why they actually call this the causal is just, it's, uh, yeah, so in the paper, Chet called this a causal model because actually this is a relationship when actually the gene has a causal effect on the clinical phenotype. The one that he calls reactive is the other situation where actually the gene is just reacting to variations in, in, in the clinical phenotype and they, they have also this independent model where they, they are associated just because of the QTL here, but there is no really no causal relationship between them. Well, anyway, the, so the reason that we, we can actually talk about causal inference in, in this context of system genetics where we integrate these phenotypes with genetic information, that is actually, it's like we have two reasons. The first one is that for experimental crosses, we have the, the association of the QTL with the phenotype is always causal, and also Given a causal QTL, then we can actually use this concept of, con of conditional independence to determine the causal ordering between the phenotypes. So in the first case, here I'll just give some more detail about causal relationships between QTLs and phenotypes. Okay, so as I said, in experimental process, association of a QTL and a, and a phenotype is causal. And, and so why is that? Right. So it turns out that kitchen mapping sort of, sort of mimics a randomized experiment, right? 
And randomization is considered sort of the gold standard to detect causality for two reasons. First, we have that the application of the treatment to an experimental unit always precedes the, the observation of the outcome. And in our context, what does that mean? Is that actually the genotype precedes the phenotype, right? And the second piece to it is that because of the treatment levels they are randomized across all experimental units, we have that the effects of confounding get averaged out. And in our context, we have that the Mendelian randomization of alleles during meiosis, they average out the effects of other unlinked loss on, on the phenotype. And here I have a figure to explain this better. So suppose here that you have two QTLs, one on chromosome one and another on chromosome two, and both of them actually affect the phenotype. Right? So when you look at a lot profile like this one, and you see here this big peak here on chromosome one, we have that this association here is actually representing the causal effect of, of locus A after you average out the effect of locus B. And this is because if you look here, for example, for the heterozygous, so this is a back cross, so for the heterozygous, we have that irrespective of the, of the genotype, for heterozygous on, on locus A, we have that irrespective to the genotype on locus B, these individuals here are associated with low phenotypic values, while the, the homozygous at loc locus A, irrespective of the genotype on locus B, they, they are associated with high values. So pretty much this tells that the strength of this association is pretty much the causal effect of the first QTL, of QTL on, on chromosome way. And this, of course, it's very important that the QTLs are unlinked because if they are linked, they, their effect are going to be confounded. Okay, so any questions so far? Uh, what if uh, the two QTLs are on the same chromosome? Are even very close? Sorry, could you? What if the two QTLs are on the same chromosome? Okay. they are close? Yeah, it, 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 no, if they are closely linked, then you can actually really tell. So the, they, I mean, their, their, their cause effect is going to be confounded. You really can't tell if, I mean, QTL A or QTL B because, I mean, they are closely linked. So the genotypes of individuals are going to be pretty similar in, in both locals. So, so this is very important. As long as they are unlinked, then you can actually tell these that. It's a cause effect. But if they are closely linked, then they are confounded and you cannot tell. Although you can tell that that big chunk has a causal effect. Uh, okay. So causality from QTL to phenotype follows from this analogy with a randomized experiment. But when you get to, to the causality between phenotypes, then the key concept here is conditional independence. And here I have a slide just giving some, some intuition about what does that mean. So suppose you have a model, right, where the QTL affects G and G affects C, right? If you look here, you're going to see that the QTL is associate, marginally associated with G, right? And the QTL is also marginally associated with C in this example. And when you say that two variables are marginally associated, what we mean is that knowing the value of one variable actually gives you information about the value of the other, right? So in this situation, if you know that the genotype of an individual is heterozygous here, you would predict that, I mean, this individual with a high probability is going to have a, a low phenotypic value. While if you know that the genotype is actually homozygous, you would predict that this individual has a, a, a high phenotypic value. So now let's switch to co the conditional independence, right? So what I'm showing here in this plot is actually the regression of this C variable on G, right? So in black here, we have the regression line. And in red, I'm showing the residuals of the regression. So the residuals are pretty much everything that's not explained by the regression, and they're pretty much noise, right? So when you look at, at, at when you look for association of the residuals of C given G in the QTL, now you don't see anything. So 
so what's happening here is that conditional on the value of g, so what that means, if you know the value of g, pretty much the QTL has no further information about c. So this is how we interpret this concept of conditional independence. Right? You, we think in terms of information flow, and given that you know the value of this variable here, this one doesn't have any more information about C. So a, a, any questions here? Are you saying the reverse? That, uh, the with C? Sorry? Yeah, you, you can do that, and I'm going to show you. Yeah, next slide, actually. So, so can you, can you tell me what is Q and what is G here? Q is a Q being put in the sleep? Yes, you can think, yeah, so you. Is it transcript or a gene? G could be a, a transcript, the expression of a gene, and C could be another expression of another gene or a clinical phenotype, uh, a protein level, a metabolite level. So G and C are phenotypes, and Q is the QTL. And sorry, I should have made that more, more clear in the beginning. At the nucleotide level, maybe, you know, expression sweep, you are here trying to... Yeah. All right, so then what happens is that when we look at these models here, the causal reactive independence model, we see that actually if you look at, uh, at the residuals for, so suppose that actually the data comes from the causal model, right? So if you look at the residuals of C conditional on G, right? Because you are blocking here the flow of information pretty much, there is no association between C and Q and you say that they are conditionally independent, right? However, in this situation here, if you condition on C, there is two informa information flowing from Q to, to G. So there is still association here. For the reactive model, you have a different pattern of, of conditional independences. So in this case, we have that condi uh, uh, conditional on G, right? There is this path still open here. But when you condition on C, these guys, they become independent. Here, and for the independence model, it doesn't matter. So if you hear condition on C, there is still association of Q and condition on G. There is still association of Q and C. And here, if you condition on G, there is still association uh, of uh, Q, yeah, Q and C here. Right. So why is that important to look at these different patterns of conditional independence relationship? It turns out that although this is not always the case, but for most parametric families that we work on, this is true. So if you have two models, that have different sets of conditional independence relationships, they are going to have different scores. And if they have exactly the same set of conditional independence relationships, they are going to have the same score, and you cannot tell the difference between them. So, I mean, causality in this context of, of system genetics is basically what you get to causality because when you incorporate, you augment these simple networks with these QTL nodes you're pretty much introducing new sets of conditional independence relationships that allow you to distinguish between models that you couldn't distinguish before. So, a any questions here? I mean, this idea is something very, I mean, very similar to the Mendelian randomization. The Mendelian randomization explains actually the, the, the causal relationship from QTO to phenotype, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? But between the phenotype, I mean, to get the causal ordering between two phenotypes, then the concept is actually conditional independence, right? Because you are looking at different, I mean, models with different sets of conditional independence relationships, you can actually tell the difference between them. Uh, any questions? So, I mean, this is, here is just a motivation, some basic concepts. Why is that that we get to, to causality in this? And now I'm. It is not the same thing as Mendelian randomization, just to be clear. Both are valid, both are good, but there are different issues. Okay, okay. <laughs> so you can, can feel me later. Mm -hmm. 
So now I'm actually switching gears and now I'm going to start talking about this causality test per se for pairs of phenotypes. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that we should note when we are actually trying to model causality between pairs of phenotypes is that actually our pairwise models, they are collapsed versions of more complex networks, right? So if you look here, for example, at ne network C here, our collapsed version, we have that this path connecting the QTL to the phenotype Y1 is represented by this arrow. These two paths connecting Y1 to Y2 are represented by this other arrow here. And this other path connecting Q to Y2 is represented by this other arrow here. Right? And so when we talk, there is, when you have, for these pairwise met models, when you say that there is a causal relationship, we don't really mean that it's a direct causal relationship, but all you mean that's actually, th there is a causal path, and this path can actually be mediated by a bunch of other phenotypes. And another thing that you should keep in mind here is that actually for these pairwise models, by I mean, by definition, they are misspecified because they are a very simple representation of a much, much more complex network of phenotypes. So in that sense, they are misspecified because they are a very, very simple and reduced model of what's going on in, in reality, right? So, so a, as I said, a, even though, even when we are using these very, very simple models, it's still so shed in 2005, it was really, really successful in identifying and also experimentally validate gene, genes related to obesity in, in mouse crosses. So why is the reason that we are still working on, on, on this problem? And the reason that we do is that actually the approach that they use, they, they are just using a simple model selection approach where they actually use AAC scores to score the different methods and the different models and the model with the lowest score is the one that they select. But the problem with that is that actually you have no measure of uncertainty associated with this model selection call, right? So you have a call, but you don't know if this call is statistically significant or not. And Steve uh, tomorrow is going to be talking uh, about uh, an approach where he can actually measure uncertainty associated with these calls and also a bunch of measures of model fit. He's going to be talking uh, about that tomorrow. And uh, so there is uh, some approach try to, but it, it's not directly related to, to what Shed did here. He's going to be using these structural equation models. And another thing is that with noise data, this mo mod if you just apply a simple model selection procedure, you, you can actually get a, a really large number of false positives. So here is just an illustrative example. Here, what I did, I simulated 1,000 data sets and using really, really nice data. So I simulated data from this simple model here with high noise, weak signal, and small sample size. And then I fit model M1 that actually corresponds to this model here. I also fit model M2 where we have the the inverted causal relationship between the phenotypes. Then for each one of the simulations, I computed a log likelihood ratio, right? And if this log likelihood ratio is positive, meaning that actually model M1 fitted the data better than, than model M2, I select M1. And if it's negative, meaning that actually the model M2 fitted the data better, I select M2, right? And these are, are the results here. So in blue, I'm plotting here the true positives. So those are actually the, the, the simulations where I actually correctly select model M1 that corresponds to the model that actually generated the data. And in red, I have the si simulations where I actually I select this model one, the, the wrong one. And the y-axis here, I'm plotting here the, the r-square of the regression of y2 on q. Uh, and so what does that mean is that the R squared measures the amount of variability explain, that Q explains, the amount of variability of Y2 that is explained by Q. And here I have the, the R squared for, for the regression of Y1 on, on Q. So it's interesting to note that there is this very nice separation here across the diagonal. 
So pretty much below the diagonal, you're selecting the correct model. Above the diagonal, you're selecting the, the incorrect one. What completely makes sense, because if you look here, for example, you're in, in this simulation here, right, we have that Q explain pretty well the variability of, of Y2 and was really bad to explain the variability of Y1. So of course, this model is going to fit better the data, right? But the thing is that if you don't have a measure of statistical significance, you, you can actually pick up this. With, with noise data, you can actually pick up a lot and lots of, of false positives. Okay. So, so pretty much we want a, pro, a statistical procedure that is able to select these models, but we want to attach a measure of uncertainty to, to, to these models, right? But given the characteristics of our problem, you, we need that this, this approach to be able to handle specified models because after all, remember we are working with these pairwise models that are really a very rough representation of what's actually going on, right? It needs to be able to fit non-nested models because if you look here, M1, model M1, right, that corresponds to the causal model is not nested on model M2. And ideally, it should be, anali uh, uh, should be fully analytical so that we can actually do the computation very efficiently. And it turns out that there is this, mo this statistical test that's called Wong's test. And this, is a, a, this paper, Wong published this work in econometrics. So this is a very well known approach in, the, in, in econometrics, not so much in statistics but it's well, very well known in econometrics. And this test actually satisfies these three criteria. And here I'm actually showing the results of application of Wong's test to that simulate data. So now we see, right, that of that huge number of false positives, like 318, now we just detect just one. And this is actually that case that actually the q explain a lot of the variability of Y2 and Y1. And here, the, the price that we pay is that also we have a drastic reduction in our power to detect the correct ones. So Wong's test, it, it's actually a, quite a, a conservative test. So you can control pretty well your false positives, but the price you pay is that you have a drastic reduction in your power to detect the, the correct ones. But, and so here's just some more intuition about how Wong's test work. So pretty much, as I said, for Wong's test, you are actually considering two, just two models. So you are comparing, for example, M1 against M2. And the new hypothesis that you test is that M1 is not closer to the true model than M2. And the, this distance is measured according, according to the kubak liber distance between two probability models, but I'm not going to get into the technical details. And the alternative hypothesis is that actually M1 is closer to the true model than M2. And under this new hypothesis, we have that the test statistic of the, the test statistic of Wong's test is pretty much just a scale version of the log likely ratio of two models. And he showed that, uh, I mean, this converts to a normal zero one, so it's really easy to implement. And and here, so this part here is the, the log likelihood ratio. And when F1 hat is pretty, it's just the density of your model evaluated at the maximum likelihood estimate. And the interesting thing about this is that, I mean, sometimes, of course, if one model fits the data much better, suppose that model M1 fits the data much better than model M2, then this likelihood ratio is going to be pretty high. But what happens is that sometimes both models fit the data really poorly, but one of them is really horrible. And in a situation like that, this is still can be very, very high. But the things that observe that actually now we are scaling by this factor here that's actually the sample variance of the log likelihood ratio scores. So in these very noisy situations, what happens is that even though this part can be pretty, high, pretty big, the value, the variance here is also going to be big. So pretty much you're going to shrink the test statistic 
towards zero so that a situation where, where you are going to, to make, a, a, instead of making a, so, so instead of making pretty much the, it's not going to be statistically significant, right? So those are the situations, right? Sometimes we can have a very high log like ratio, but because that term here are also big, it shrinks the test statistic to zero, close to zero, and you don't get, so your model selection call is not significant. The price we pay that sometimes, I mean, it's going to reduce the power also for the situations where, for the true positives to, to detect the true positives. So a any questions so far? Okay. So, but, so Wong's test, as I said, handles just a pair of models, right? But in our contest, we actually have not just a pair, we actually have four. So we have the, the causal model here, the reactive, the independence, and also we have this that I call the full model or the correlated model. So far, I haven't talked about this one just for simplicity of the explanations, but actually in reality, we fit these four models here. And this fourth model here actually corresponds to a whole family of different models. Because it turns out that this model here, this model, and this model, they are likelihood equivalent. You can't tell the difference between them. But at least you can distinguish this model from these others, and those also are distinguishable between them. Okay, so, so what we do here, we develop three different versions of this causal model selection test. So we have a parametric version that's actually intersection union test of three Wong's tests. So if we want to get a, a, a p-value for, for model M1, what you do, you, you do a Wong's test comparing M1, oh, sorry, M1 against M2, and then M1 against M3, and then M1 against M4, right? And the new hypothesis that we are testing here with our intersection union test is actually that M1 is not closer to the true model than the other models against the, the alternative that actually M1 is the closer one to the true model than the others. We also have a non-parametric version of this causal model selection test that's actually intersection in union of three Clark's test. And Clark's test is just a, a non-parametric version of Wong's test. And also we, we, we develop here a joint parametric test where it's pretty much an extension of this one, but where we actually account for the correlation among the test statistics of the Wong test. Because if you think, if you see here, when you do a Wong test of M1 against M2, the, the test statistic depends on, on, on the log likelihood of model M1. Here it's also going to depend on that same log likelihood. And, and here again, so all test statistics, they are correlated. So in this test, we, we pretty much model them jointly to account for the correlation structure of the, the statistics. And here's just a detail. Since in our models they have different dimensions, instead of using the log, like, log likelihood, we actually use a penalized log li likelihood where we can use either the AAC or the BAC penalties. But in terms of the asymptotics, it still doesn't change anything because this term goes to zero as sample size is increased. So you still can, can plug in your penalized log likelihood ratio here and you still have the same new distribution. So any questions so far? Yeah, how, does, how do you calculate the variance of the negative ratio? So, so you get, so you have your data, right? You feature your model, you get the maximum likelihood estimates. Then for each data point, you just evaluate that you just evaluate the density at the maximum likelihood for that particular data point. So you have a bunch of random variables and then you just get the sample variance across them, yeah. I, I don't think that the uh, variance of the likelihood ratio, it's a variance of uh, likelihood of contribution. 
I mean, mm. how is this data point distributed to the likelihood? I mean, the no, you use the null to get the maximum likelihood estimate, okay. and then you just plug in yeah. that maximum likelihood estimate that you use all data points to get, but then you just evaluate each a cheat sample, you just get what's the numerical value for that. You just plug in the data on, yeah, and you can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, my question is, uh, you know, when you are selecting, uh, I mean, among four models, can you, can you define one style? Sure. Here is only, uh, I think here is only uh, the lack of ratio between model one and model two. Uh, yeah, but this applies to all of them. I, 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 yeah. I, I know, but I mean, your hypothesis is um, model one better than all three other models. Right. So, do you, I mean, perform each test for each comparison? One type of test? Yeah, so, yeah, you should have made that more clear. So, in order, so pretty much we perform four different okay. tests. So. To get a p-value for a model one, what you do, you do a Vuong's test of M1 against M2, M1 against M3, and M1 against M4. Then you, you just, your p-value is going to be the maximum across the p-value of these three um, Vuong's tests, and you get a p-value for M1. Then for model M, M2, you compare M2 against M1, M2 against M3, M2 against M4. You get a p-value for model M, M2, and you do so for model M3 and M4. Really, there will be a multiple testing issues, right? Yeah, but you are just doing four tests. It's no big deal. Mm. Yeah. Will you address that in simulations? I mean, it, just it, it, model testing here, and then you got multiple testing you're doing across um, all the different Yeah, but it's uh, yeah, but this is across different tests. Yeah, I know. But here, I think he's talking about inside. But yeah. It, Okay. All right. Okay. So here I have some some example with is, is data. So I'm, here I'm using the genetic genomics data from Brain Kugliak, 2005. So we have data on 112 strains of yeast. Have expression measurements in about 6k transcripts. Dense genotype data on about 3k. And what's most important is that for yeast we can actually evaluate the precision of our causal prediction using validated relationships from, from, from database of knockout experiments. So you, you already know, for at least for these 247 genes, there are experiments out there where they actually knock out it, and you know which, which genes are actually affected by knockout. So you already have the validation, the biological validation ready. So, what, what, so in each, as I said, in each one of these experiments, right, one gene is knockout. And then you have, what you do, you have expression levels for the remaining genes, in both in control and knockout strains. And you interrogate them for differential expression. So the set of differentially expressed genes form the knockout signature for one particular knockout gene. And this knockout signature is pretty much a validated set of causal relationships, experimentally validated set of causal relationships. And we have, at least for 247 genes, we, ha we do have this data, okay? So to, to leverage this information here for the causality test, what I did, I determined each one of these 247 genes also had a significant QTL in our data set. And for each one that, had a significant EQTL. What I did, I did mapping analysis and I select all traits that co map it to, to that gene. And this is our target, our putative target list. And for this, for each gene and their putative target list, what I did, I applied this causality test where I use phenotype, the knockouted gene as the Y1 phenotype and the, the other genes as the Y2, and I use actually the QTL of the knockout gene as the causal anchor. And out of the 247, turns out that 135 knockout genes actually showed significant linkage, both in cis and trans. And the number, for each gene, the number of targets varied, but in total, we had almost 32K. So this is actually the number of 
fits that I, I did. And to evaluate the performance, we, we have this biologically validated true positives, false positives, and precision. So a true positive is any, any uh, statistically significant causal relationship that the methods detected that, that turns out that actually that core gene actually affected that particular gene in, in the target list, right? A false positive is the ones that we, we, we infer as causal, but turns out that they, that particular gene does not belong to, to the to the target, to, to the to the uh, knockout signature, right? and then we evaluated the, the the precision, the biologically validated precision, just as the ratio of the true positives and true positives plus false positives. And here are the results. So first, I'm showing the results for season trans for all the 135 genes. So here I'm showing the true positives, false positives, and the precision. Right. Black is the BIC, where we don't have any measure of statistical of uncertainty. Blue is, is the, the joint BAC approach, and I'm, here I'm using just the, the, the methods based on the BIC score. Green is the parametric version, and red is the non-parametric version. So we see here that in terms of true positives, if you don't use any sort of statistical measure of uncertainty, we have a, a large number of true positives, but also a huge number of false positives. And for, for the methods where you actually have statistical significance, and by the way, here the x axis is just the significant levels that I use. So I'm looking here from significant levels varying from 01 to, to, to 0.1. You see that we detect way I mean, a much smaller number of true positives, but also a much smaller number of false positives. And uh, when you look at the precision, right, we have that when we, we attach this measure of percentage, what's not surprising at all, right, we, we get a better precision. And another thing that we see here is that actually the joint test turns to be the one, it's actually the most conservative with the smaller power, but also the most precise of them. But if you see here, I mean, the precision is not that great, but remember that these are actually the precision of biologically validated ones. But we can also just look at the results if you just, uh, just look at the C traits. Okay, so in this case, it turns out that 27 of the 135 candidates were actually Cs. Right? So if you focus here, you're going to see actually a, a good increase in precision. Right? And if you put them side by side, you see that they sort of almost double the precision if you just focus on the C traits. Okay? And the, the reason for that is that pretty much for the C traits, we are in this in the situation where actually the, the, the QTL explains a lot of the variability of the C trait and not so much for, for the trans one. So that's why it's, it's just easier to pick up these guys. And in practice, yeah, it's, if you, I mean, testing trans by trans is tricky and you can get many, many false positives. Okay, so, I mean, so the conclusion about this part is that pretty much the CMST test, what they do, they trade a, a reduction in the rate of false positives by decreasing statistical power, right? And whether you want a, a, a more precise, uh, a more powerful and less precise method, or a, a less precise and more powerful, uh, a less powerful and more precise method depends on, on your goals, right? So if you can actually screen a huge, no I mean, you can do valid biological validations on a huge number of targets, you might want to do a, a more powerful, less precise method, but usually it's the case that it's very time consuming and expensive to do this validation experiment. So biologists tend to prefer a smaller list where you can actually trust the results with higher confidence. Okay, so any questions? Next, we, we are going to switch to networks. Uh, Just to causality, animal models comparatively easier because they can generate knockout by itself. Yeah. Experimentally validated. 
there I have the data on the genotype of some subject, I have the data on the phenotype, which could be quantitative or qualitative, mm -hmm. and then I have the in-between transcript data, which is a quantitative stress. Mm -hmm. So how I align this, that whether the genotype affected the transcript level and that bias affected the phenotype, mm -hmm. that model is correct, or the other way. So how you implement this kind of test in human? I mean, I have seen the source paper, very source paper that was on the mouse cross, mm -hmm. Um, how do you think you can implement this in human expression and data? In principle, you can, right? As long as you have, for example, both phenotypes, they're associated with one SNP. But I mean, in human populations, you need to be careful because sometimes the association of the SNP with the phenotypes is actually do for example, to population structure and things like that. So you have to account for that. But if you account for that, in principle, if you have a SNP that is associated with both of them, and then you can actually... Is there any study there, public study, that, that has used human data and implemented in human? Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, definitely. I mean, people have applied this um, marker-based or the instance method to human data. But I think what you're asking is how to validate it. Yeah, do they work? <laughs> so often, often we do it in indirect means. For example, if you find a causal Okay, so now we are switching gears and now we are going to start to talk about causal Bayesian networks and in particular this algorithm here. So starting first with standard Bayesian networks, so here we are just talking about phenotypes, we are not integrating genetics at all. Turns out that a Bayesian network is pretty much just a directly a cyclic graph, so it's a graph like this that does not have a cycle, right? And the, the, the important thing is that conditional on the parents of a node, a node is independent of its non-descendants. So for example here, if you know, I mean conditional on the value of five, six is independent of all these other guys here. Right? Conditional on, on, on three and four, five is independent of these two guys. So pretty much you have a very complex joint probability distribution and you can factor this in local pieces because of this Markov property, okay? But, I mean, even though you have arrows and people are always, I mean, very, they, they want to interpret this as causality. When you have these standard Bayesian networks, you cannot really talk about causality. So, I mean, what the, the standard Bayesian networks, they do, they just, they are, uh, 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 they are pretty much, the factorization of the, the arrows is just a way to factor a representation of conditional independence and dependence relationships. So what I mean, for example, if you have these three phenotype networks, right, they are completely different causal models, if you try to inter interpret these as causal models, right, but it turns out that they have exactly the same set of conditional independence. In this case, we have that two and one are independent, conditional on two, in all cases. So uh, as I already showed, what does that mean is that actually they are Markov equivalent, they have the same set of conditional independence relationships and you cannot distinguish them using the data. So pretty much when you try to score these models, these very different models often are going to have the same score. The only one that's going to have a different score is the one where you have Y1 and Y3 pointing to Y2. This one has a different score and you can distinguish that one for these other three. But among these three, there is no way. Right? So I pretty much already just described this. So the way that genetics enter for, for the Bayesian networks, there are two main approaches. One is to actually create priors over the network structures, and this is what Jung, Jung actually does, so he's probably going to be talking more in, in more detail about this on Friday. And the other way is to actually just augment the phenotype networks with Kichon nodes that the approach that uh, we use at the QTL net. Questions? So just really briefly about the genetic prior. So the idea is, suppose you have these two models here, right? 
they have the same set of conditional independence relationships, so you cannot tell the difference between them if you try to score the models here, right? But if you, if both if these phenotypes they come map to the same culture, you can actually do this causal pairwise causality calculations and use the results to come up with a prior probability for one of these models, right? So even though the likely the marginal likelihoods here they are going to be exactly the same, and you can tell the difference between them. If you have the results of this causality test, you can come up with priors for these different models, so that actually the posterior distribution, the ratio of the posterior, is going, you are going to, to bias based on, on the results of the causality test. And this is actually the approach used by John. And as I said, the approach that you use, we use at QTL Net is different. So what we do, we augment these networks with Kitchell nodes. And pretty much by doing that, we introduce new sets of conditional independence relationships. So in this case, we have now that conditional on Y1, Y2, and Q are independent in this model. But in this model, actually, when you condition on Y1, they are going to become dependent. So we can tell the difference between these models. And um, for learning the structure of these Bayesian networks, is, is computationally uh, a hard problem, computational problem. And we use here a Bayesian approach where our goal here is to get the posterior distribution of each network given the data. So here is just base formula. This piece here is the marginal likelihood, the prior predictive distribution that you get just by averaging out all parameters of the model. And for some, for, for example, for linear regression and multinomial models, actually, if you use conjugate priors, this has a closed analytical form. You can also use BAC approximations for these things. And this other term here is just the prior distribution. And as I said, Jones actually built these priors here. And Kichonet actually, although we can, uh, bias using different priors. What we do is pretty much just use the same prior uh, probability for each network model. And the tricky part is this one, computing this marginal distribution here because the number of, mo of networks that we have is huge. So for example, just looking at the number of phenotype nodes, right? if you have two phenotype nodes, you have three different networks. If you have three, you have 25, four, this number. If, if you have 30, that's the number of possible networks that you have. So th there is no way that you can compute the score for each one of them. And you have to use uh, heuristic algorithm to, to actually search the, the space of networks efficiently. And what we, what, what we do is actually use a Metropolis Hastings. And I'm not actually going to get into the details. I'm just going to describe at a high level what the QTL net algorithm does. So pretty much what we do is a, a joint inference of the causal phenotype network and the genetic asso architecture associated with the network, where actually we, we do QTL mapping conditional on the structure of the network. But because the structure of the network is also unknown, you don't know, right? You have to learn it. So pretty, uh, what we do, we have this iterative algorithm where actually we update the network structure, condition on genetic arch architecture. That means that actually we use the genetic architecture to score the whole network, not just the phenotypes. And then given, uh, the, condition, given the structure of the phenotype network, we infer the, the, the QTL, so we do QTL mapping conditional on the structure. And actually, in the, in the tutorial, I have a little example you are going to, to understand that a little better. And finally, it turns out that QTL net is actually a mixed Bayesian network where you have continuous and discrete nodes. The continuous nodes are the phenotypes, and the discrete ones are the, the QTLs. And so here is a figure to show how the metropolis works. Okay. So I'm, there are different samplers, and here I'm just describing the simplest one. So this is the standard structure sample. So suppose, this is a metropolis hashing, so at a given iteration here, suppose that you have a network like this, right? So in black are the phenotypes, in red the QTLs. And so at this particular state of the chain, you have this model here. So what you do, you do a simple 
modification of the network. You can either I add, I add, you can drop one or you can reverse. If you add or reverse, you need to, to be careful, make sure that you don't have a cycle because you can, cannot have cycles. But let's suppose here that we have this phenotype network here and in this case the proposed modification is a simple addition right, of an edge here. So we modify the phenotype network, we, we, we redo the QTL mapping, conditional on the structure of the network, we infer which ones, which QTL affects each phenotype. Okay. And then we have a score that, to get the score we use the whole network, phenotypes and QTLs. Here we also have a score for this one, and these scores enter in, in, in the computation of the acceptance probability of the metropolis regions, and suppose that we, we accepted this new one. So then we save this network here, it becomes M old here, M new becomes M old, and then we do another modifi modification of the, the structure. So in this case, suppose that you drop an edge here. Then what you do, you again determine the, the the, the genetic architecture conditional on this structure here. You get a score using phenotypes and QTLs. You, you have this score here. You compute the acceptance probability. Say that in this case you reject. Then you save this one again and you keep doing that. Do you allow for any kind of a film bank? I Sorry? Mean, any kind of a film bank? I mean, you're always greedily searching for the, the highest it's not a grid search, it's actually a metropolis hashing. So basically in the metropolis uh, acceptance probability, okay. you have the ratio of the scores, but uh, even when it's possible that a network with a high score does not get accepted. Okay. So it's not a grid search, it's actually. A, yeah. So what happens in the end of the day, so you, you go, so you keep with the algorithm, so you sample a bunch of these network structures, right? And in the end of the day, you have a whole, you have a MCMC posterior sample of network structures. So what you do, so you look at each one of these models and you pretty much count the number of, that each network show up. So these actually are posterior probabilities for each network model, and what we do we, we, instead of selecting just the, the network with the highest posterior probability, what we could in this little example with just four nodes, if you have, actually, if you have a, a, a large network, what happens is that the space is so big that none of the networks is going to have a very high posterior probability. So you have to average across all of them, right? So you have your posterior sample, and what you do, you compute for each, pair of nodes, you compute these average probabilities here. So, and what you do pretty much, so if you want to compute what is the probability of one affecting two, you just sum the frequencies of the, the models where I actually you have here. So in this case, you have M1, M3, and M4, right? So you sum all these frequencies, and this is your probability for this direction. Situation where you don't have an edge, you just sum this with this and this, right? And the reverse direction, you just sum. No. So that, that's in, in the end. So that network that you saw at the end is actually the result of this Bayesian model averaging. And here I'm not showing the QTLs, but yeah, we also have the QTLs there. So yeah, so here. Oh. Sure. Well, actually, we, we don't actually check for a, a cyclist at the, the Bayesian at the Bayesian model averaging step. So at the but end, it, the averaging it, could it's average possible. I never seen that happen. Yeah. But I mean, theory. No, oh. Uh, okay, <laughs> sorry. So uh, he, you ask it whether actually we check for a cyclicity at the end of the Bayesian model averaging process. And the answer is no, and it's possible in theory to, to get a cycle there when you do. But I mean, in practice, I never seen that happen. 
So here, really quickly, just an example here. So again, it's the East data, right? So we build a phenotype network around PGAM7, the same that Brian showed, and as he, he showed that actually this gene is physically located here on this chromosome 15. It turns out that this is actually the cis gene with the largest number of significant causal calls according to the CMSG joint test. And here you use a significance level of 001. There's other 23 uh, of the, the targets show a significant causal call. And then we got, we put them all together and generated a causal model. And I mean, as we would expect, PGM7 shows up here in the top of the network in driving the, the, the transcription of all other nodes. So, so here are some reference. I think it's pretty much it. I just want to acknowledge the co-authors, Brian, Mark, Alan, Bean, John, and Amy. So that's, I think that's it. So if you have further questions. not really fast yeah so I think that I mean running my laptop here so so yeah the, the convert okay so the conversions so here I actually show this very simple approach but actually we have implemented a different approach that's some um, and I'm going to actually show that in the tutorial that actually th this one actually the convergence of this standard sampler it's really really poor so yeah there are other metropolis versions that are actually much better and i'm going to show in, in the in a moment in, in the tutorial but yeah i would say 30 nodes 40 yeah it's you, you cannot go much bigger than that You mean for the causality test, or? Yes. Well, I mean, I, I, the data sets that I work, so we work with this, this data that's about 112, and we also work with the F2 cross that we have about 500. And I mean, for the F2 is, I mean, you get way more significant calls and it's way better. Yeah, I mean, from, from my experience, I would say that you need at least 100. And I mean, for the East data, most of the calls are actually non significant. And part of it is just because the sample size are so small, the signal is not that big. Yeah. Well, that, so yeah, that's, that's a good question. So, it, so, so if you look at this network here, right? So if you have actually a lot of QTL nodes, right? Then you, 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 you won't have any ambiguity, but sometimes it's possible to, that you don't actually get to a single network. So it, it, it is possible to get ambiguities just because you don't have, uh, Pretty much you don't have enough of these structures generated by the, by the QTL nodes, right? It's still possible to get some equivalence classes. And I mean, for a pair of nodes, sometimes what happens is that w when you see that, usually you're going to see that when you look at the, 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 the model average probability, you're going to see that this direction is almost 50%. This direction is also almost 50%. So when you do the Bayesian model averaging, you should always just I mean, you should try to use a threshold higher than 50% just to avoid this case. Because in that case, pretty much, if you don't know, in your network, they are not going to show. You could also look and actually put just manually a bidirect edge just to, to show clearly that you still have an equivalence class there. But, 
I would say mm -hmm. we take a, a little break mm -hmm. um, for maybe 10 minutes, mm -hmm. then we move with the software tutorial. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Okay, sure. Okay. All right. So, <coughs> so, so here in this tutorial, we are going to just go over some basic routines here for QTL hardware. Actually, I'm just going to, to show the main function that implements the, the causality test, explain the arguments, show a little bit of the output. The same thing here for for kitchen net. So let's run here with. All right. And you can find the R code in my uh, directory. Yeah. My, my page on my, my step interface. Okay. So first step here is to to load the libraries. To show how that actually has the functionality to implement the causality test <coughs> in QTLNet for for the oh, so <coughs> for the network approach. And the first thing we are going to do here, I'm actually going to simulate data from a toy network. Specifically, I'm actually simulate data from this toy network here, where you just have five phenotypes. Each one of these phenotypes is affected by a single QTL here. And I mean, for the tutorial here, I'm actually simulating with very strong signal, low noise, so just to make sure that things go through it, just a really illustration. So here. Also setting the seed, so that's reproducible. First thing, we generate a genetic map. So I'm actually simulating five chromosomes, each one with 100 centimorgans at each here. So this parameter here. So this is all uh, RQTL. Uh, I'm simulating just 11 markers, and they are equally spaced ones. Then after you simulate the genetic map, here we we simulate across, so I'm simulating 500 individuals from IF2. And now here, let me just step back. So what I'm going to do next, what I'm doing this little um, <coughs> for loop here, I pretty much just simulated I mean, QTL, because RQTL actually, when you simulate uh, across, it just simulates a single phenotype. So I have to simulate this in this cumbersome way. But that for loop is just to simulate QTL data and, and each, each phenotype here separately. So I do this piece here, then this piece, this piece, this piece, and this piece separately. And then this second part here, I'm actually Connecting, so I'm using uh, a, a phenotype to phenotype regression coefficient. I'm just using structural equations to simulate the data, and I'm using here a, a, a regression coefficient of one to actually simulate the data from this network here. So, and uh, yeah, another thing. So I'm just using additive effects for the key shows, and I set them to one. Okay. So now let's actually simulate the data. So now in this capital C cross here, we actually have, so if you do a summary. We have a F2, right, with five phenotypes and 100 individuals and just five chromosomes and with 11 markers, equally spaced markers. So, next step is just, as Brian described, I'm just computing here, the, the doing the missing, missing data part, so I'm using a step equal to one. So, every, every centimorgan, I'm actually getting these so markers, again, setting the seed. Now, I'm doing a, a permutation test using Churchill-Dorage Churchill approach. I'm doing 
1,000 permutations, and the QTL mapping method here is Haley not regression for this parameter here. And when we do a summary, it says that if you use a lot threshold of 3.5, you're going to, 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 to control genome-wide error rate at a 5% level. If you use 2.7, you are going to control this at 10%. And we are going to actually use the 5% one. So next step is to do scan. So I'm doing scanning each one of the five phenotypes separately. So this phenocolume argument here, you can, I'm just saying that do the QTL mapping for phenotypes one to five. Again, using handling not regression. And I'm plotting here the results just for chromosome one. So we see, right, that, I mean, this is simulate data with strong signal. So we see that actually all traits, all the five traits mapped to, to the QTL on chromosome one. And this QTL actually, I forgot to mention that, but in the simulations, we, we, I actually set the QTL to be exactly here in the middle. So if you look here at the network, you would expect that everybody actually maps to Q1, right? Because there is a direct relationship Q1 to Y1, but also I mean, the, the information flows from Y1 to Y2, so Y2 should also map to this guy. Same here to Y3, same here to Y4, and Y5 should also map. And this is what we, we are seeing here, right? So everybody maps to, to, to the Kichwell phenotype Y1, so now what I'm going to do, I'm going to apply the causality test of Y1 against Y2, Y3, Y4, and Y5. So this is, so names here is just getting the names of the phenotypes. So we have Y1 to Y5, right? And this is the main function to, to fit the CMST test. So the first ar argument here is the cross object, the architecture cross object. Phenotype one should be just a single phenotype, and in this case, I'm actually using Y1. Your name is at position one. And for phenotype two, you can either specify just one or a list of other phenotypes. The output of the function is a little bit different if you just have one, if you're testing one phenotype against a single one, but if you're testing one phenotype against a list of other ones, it's, uh, the output's a little different and it's more summarize it. Yeah. And in any case, in this, in this example, I'm testing Y1 against Y2, Y3, Y4, and Y5. Q chromosome is actually the, the chromosome of the, the, the QTL that you're using as a causal anchor. Q position is the, the St. Morgan position of, of the QTL that you're using as the causal anchor. I'm using here five, five here in the middle, 50 cent Morgans. Additive covariates, you can actually, even though I'm not using it here, but our implementation allows for additive covariates, for example, sex, age, things like that. You can also have interactive uh, covariates. And method, we have, uh, uh, for, for method, we, we here I'm setting to all. Right? But you can specify if you want just the join, CMST test, the parametric, or the, or the non-parametric. And if you set to all, it's going to output the results for all, three of them. And here, penalty, you can choose either A, C, or B, B, U, C. Here I'm using B, U, C. So let's run it. So here is the output. So it, it outputs here the, the R, R2 statistic of the regression of Y1 on Q and also uh, of the, the second phenotype on Q, right? So these are just the R squares. 
we all, it also output the BEC scores. So each line, and by the way, each line here is, so this is the, the causality test between Y1 and Y2, here Y1 and uh, Y3, Y1 versus Y4 and Y1 versus Y5. And here we, we also have the BAC scores and also the, the test statistics for, 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 for the CMST, but the, the interesting ones are here, the, the p-values, right? So p value 1 is actually the p-value for the, the causal model, p2 is for the reactive model, and p3 for the independence one, and p4 for the, for the, the full model, right? In this case, giving the very strong signal, I mean, we, we did get significant results for all of them. And th those are the results for the joint CMST test here for the parametric one, and here for the non-parametric. So, it's, I mean, to implement this test, pretty much all you have to do is just use this function. You have to do the mapping beforehand, so you have to know the, the position of mm -hmm. your Q cells and the cro which chromosome they are located, but then you can actually do this test, and it's actually, yeah, you can, it's, it's fully analytical, so it's pretty fast. Okay, so th that's pretty much it just for CMST. So all I have to do is this function, and now I'm going to start doing the, the network stuff. But before that, I just want to show you the results of, uh, of uh, marginal and conditional QTL mapping, because this is going to be important to understand the better the, the QTL net approach. So let me just plot here the results. So here in, in the top panels, I'm just doing a marginal, the, the marginal scan of each one of the phenotypes, right? So phenotype one only mapped to, to the QTL one. And that's exactly what you would expect here because we simulate data from this network. So Q1 maps here, right? For phenotype two, we see that actual phenotype two maps to Q1 and also Q2, as you would expect here, because there is, it indirectly maps to Q1 via phenotype one, and, but it also maps to, to the QTL that directly affects it, right? And so on. Phenotype three actually maps to, to, to Q1, Q2, and Q3. Phenotype four maps to Q1, Q2, and Q4. And phenotype five, interestingly, maps to Q1, Q2, Q3, but not for Q5. And what's going on here is that pretty much, so you see here, this is actually at the bottom of the network. And because I actually set the, the, the partial regression values like pretty high, it turns out that the correlation of this guy with Q1 is actually higher than the correlation of Y5 with Q5. The same here for this other QTL. So interesting, you, you don't pick up the direct QTL. You just pick up the ones with the, the indirect ones. If you do just marginal mapping without conditioning or anything. And these are actually the results of QTL mapping when we, we condition on the structure of the network. So, I mean, here for Y1 it's the same thing. But for Y2, if you look here in the network, we know that Y1 is a parent of Y2. So if you use I1 as a covariate in the mapping, pretty much you block the influence of Q1 on Y2. And that's exactly what we see here, right? Condition on Y1, you, you, you don't see, let me actually do this. So condition on, on Y1, you don't see any, you completely, there is no association anymore between Q1 and Y2, right? The same thing here, so condition on, on Y2, uh, it, it should be actually, uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. For, for Y3, actually condition on Y2, you are going to block the influence of Q1 and Q2, so those peaks, they drop. You just have Y3 and the same, I mean, condition on Y2 also, you just have here, this peak here. 
And now, interesting when you condition on y3 and y4, right? Condition on these two guys, then we pretty much block the influence of all QTLs. Then this QTL that you didn't detect at all at the marginal mapping, it, it picks up here, right? So this is just to illustrate that, I mean, it's, if you're actually interested in, in the genetic architecture, it's interesting to do the map conditional on the network structure. Because if you don't do that, it, you're going to pick up a bunch of QTLs that actually just affect that phenotype indirectly, right? And sometimes you also you can also miss some of the of the phenotypes that direct affect the the, the QTL. Yeah, why in the conditional scans does the mod score go up for the direct QTL? So, for example, this, the, the second panel there, mm -hmm. um, the Q2 goes from a lot of 20 to 50. Yeah. When you condition on Q1. Yeah, and because I'm in here, Mark, what's going on is that when you do the marginal mapping of this guy here, right, pretty much part of the, I mean, it, it, when you are just for this, for this thing here, it, this is going to increase pretty much because you are, I mean, it, it, they are not competing. So this, so you, you can think as, exactly. Exactly. No. I mean, Q1 and Q2 are instead, but Y1 and Y2 are not. You're conditioning a Y1. Okay. Yeah. So when you lose the effect of Y1, then you have a stronger signal on Y2. Exactly. Because remember, when you look at this, you're looking so. Yeah, let me. So here, this peak here, you're just looking at the influence of Q2. Right on, on on the on this phenotype here, right. But everything that's the rest is actually entered the, no, the the model has noise. So as soon as you are just for that noise, you can actually pick up this. Right. Okay. So now. This is actually the function that implements the, the, the QTL net. So the arguments here, the first one is the cross. Again, phenocall is actually the phenotypes that you want to, to, to include in the model to generate the network. Threshold here is actually the QTL mapping threshold that you are using. And I'm setting this to 3.5. That's actually the, the one that we get from the permutation test. Again, you can adjust for additive and interactive covariates. Any sample is actually the number of, uh, of uh, samples that you're going to get in your Markov chain. Feeling, is, this parameter actually tells us that we are going to, feeling equal to three means that actually we are running the Markov chain and we are just saving a network every three steps. And this is done to actually reduce the autocorrelation. Uh, 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 on the Markov chain, and here for speed, I'm just setting this to three, but in practice, you should put 10, 20, and see the autocorrelation plus to see how well your, your chain is mixing. Um, my, my experience is actually, we can actually um, enforce that the maximum number of parents of each node is four. We are setting to four in this case. MO, we are setting to new, and this is actually just, if you want to specify what's the initial network that you want to, to start the Markov chain, you can specify it here. Burning, point two means that 20% of the samples we are going to throw away. That's our burning of the Markov chain. Method here specifies the, the QTL mapping method that we use in the algorithm, and we, we are using Haley knot. Uh, handle seed is just to, to fix a seed so you can reproduce the results. This is related to this thing here, setting this to, to no or zero pretty much. The initial network that you use is completely, has no edges at all. Save scores, this is an important thing. So if you want, what, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to run and pretty much we are doing the QTL mapping, I mean, uh, on the fly. Right, 
But if if you if you want if you, if you want you can actually pre compute. Oh, you, you do the the Kichel mapping beforehand. You pre and then you look at all possible combinations of node versus four parents, and you store all the the, the scores, the BAC scores, and then instead of computing these in, on the fly as the algorithm goes, you can you just have a lookup table where you do a modification of the network and just go there and look what is the value of the score instead of having to, to, to compute it. And this is important, the have method. And this is the one that actually should be using. This is the, the, the yeah, I'm going to show what this method does in, in a second. And the one that I show in the, in the lecture is actually the stru structure move. That, that's not advisable at all because you can actually get stuck very easily. This one is much better. And variables here is just, yeah, you're going to see. I'm putting us through, and it's going to, as it runs, it's going to print some, some interesting things. So, but first, let me show you something here. So, yeah, so do, during the, the lecture, I just explained this simpler sam sampler here, right? So this is the standard uh, Medigan, uh, I think it's 95. It's pro proposed this sampler where you do just simple modifications of the network. You can add, drop, or reverse the edge. If you add or reverse, you have to check for cycles, right? But the problem with that, since you are doing a very small modification in the network at the time, actually the Markov chain, is, I mean, the mixing is really, really poor. Really, really poor. So there is this other paper but I cannot pronounce this name in Husmeyer, 2008, where they actually proposed a different uh, edge reversal move. So what they do, they select here, and this is what is implemented here. So when you set rev met method to this one, you're actually using this, this metropolis here. So what you do pretty much you select a, 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 a an edge here, then you drop this edge here, then you, you ad identify the parents of these two nodes connected by the edge that you does, just drop. You drop them two, so pretty much you orphan the nodes, then you reverse the direction of this edge here, so before you have from E to D, now you have from D to E, right? And then you sample again new parents for both of them. And this example is to only D, but for D, he sample B and C, right? So there are pretty much two advantages here. First, if you're doing this way, you, I mean, you can always reverse a edge, right? Because in the other sampler, sometimes if you reverse a edge and you have a cycle, I mean, it's forbidden, right? But if you do this more drastic move here, reversal move, you, you can always reverse. And most importantly, you can see that actually you do a, a, a more drastic modification of the network. So pretty much, and also when you reverse and you select new, new parents, they sort of become adapted to this new edge direction. So pretty much the mixing of the chain is much, much better than if you use that, that method. And here are some examples. So this is the structure. This is also from yeah, Husmeyer, 2008. And they have these two. So here they are running the chain two times. And you see here that this time it got stuck it here. And with this new reversal move, actually, the chain mixing well and you avoid getting stuck. So yeah, you should. We still have the, the other option there, but you should actually use this one. So let's run it. So here, you see these outputs here. Sometimes when you, you have those lines that mean that you are computing, doing the QTL mapping, but once you compute from one model, you store it, and next time that you need that same, you sample that same uh, Parent, parent set, you, you just look, because you compute and you save it. You don't recompute again. So once you compute it, you save it. 
So yeah, it ran. And then we have here some, some functionality to look at the output. So the summary actually, it shows you the, the results of the model average network and the, the probability here. And in this case, we see that we get the network right. So y1 affected y2, y2 affected y3 and y4. y3 affected y5 and y4 also affected y5. And the posterior probability here is one. Remember that we have uh, a burning, so we throw away the first 20%. It turns out that for the rest of the chain, we, all models that we, we, we accepted actually had these directions. That's why when you do the Bayesian model averaging, we have this probability set to one. Here is a parameter that you can actually specify here. It's, it's set to 0.5, but if you want, so if you set to 0.5, Usually it's not going to be the case, but you could potentially, you could have that problem, right, of the equivalence class. But if you set higher than this, you avoid that. Here is the, again, the posterior probabilities, but now you look at each one of the possible combinations. So those are, so for example, one in, one in three that are not really directly connected Oops. in the true network here. So we see that we, we got this direction. We got that they are not connected with a high probability here. Also one in four with high probability. So I mean, in this case, it's doing pretty well just because I mean, you have 500 individuals, a strong signal and everything. But this is just an illustration. We can also have this other sort of summary. So if you do print the output, then you, you have this, again, the model average probabilities here, right? When rows are actually the parents and columns are actually the children. So it's sort of the same information as before. But you also have, by model, the, the, the posterior probability in the BAC score. So, I mean, the, the model that, the true model is actually the one. So we sample this. In, 70% of the time we sample this, this, this model that, that corresponds exactly to the one from which we simulate the data. And the second best one is this one where we actually have an extra edge from four to, from, from two to five that actually doesn't exist. So the second one had the, just this extra edge here. And this is the frequency that we sample this network in the Markov chain, a and so on. You can also look at the, at the, the, the loci. So this actually gives you the genetic architecture conditional on the final network, on the final model average network. So we, we see that actually we are picking up the correct genetic architecture. We are avoiding all these issues here with the we, situations where you have indirect QTLs affecting the network. So pretty much for phenotype one, you are just picking up the QTL on chromosome one. For two, just the QTL on chromosome two and so on. We can plot the network. And this is the plot that Brian showed before. And where you can play around, so it's pretty neat. And also, we, you can actually look at the, at the Markov chain. So this is just showing the trace plot for, for the BAC scars. And yeah, so I think that's, we, we also have some functionality implemented to actually do um, parallel computations. But I, I won't have, I don't think I have time to go there. But I mean, the, the idea is the, the, the most time consuming step is actually doing the kitchen mapping. So what you can do, you, you pretty much, you look at all possible. So if you're using uh, the maximum number of patterns set to four, right? So you just look at all possible sets of, of nodes and its parents. So you look at node one when you condition nobody. And then you look at node one when you condition one, on two when you condition on three, four, and so on, on two by two 
combinations and then the, the three by three combinations up to the number of maximum number of parents. So for each one of these combinations of node and parents, you actually, you compute the lot scores the con where you incorporate the parents as covariates. You, s you, you compute the BACs, so you generate this table with all the scores that you need, right? And you can that do that in parallel using a cluster, right? Then given this, what you, you can do also, you run multiple Markov chains Again, each one in a, diff in a grid of computers, and then you can con concatenate the, the results of all of them. So you can actually parallelize that. I mean, so, yeah, but I'm not going to, to go into the details, but we do have this functionality already implemented. So, uh, questions? Yes, you can actually do that. Or ever have you observed that that ever helps? I yeah, maybe I can comment, comment mm. about that. Yeah, it does help. Um, another thing you can do is, is do different random starts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And take the best of the random starts. And, um, yeah. When you have a small network like this, you can get it. Sure. Yeah. So if you get three or four or five nodes, you get it. You get up to ten or fifteen. Depending on where you start and how long you run the chain, you may not, mm -hmm. you may not get near the, the, um, the best. Uh, yeah. So and it's best to, to do something. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, we don't have that. Yeah. Yeah. We don't have the magic answer, but uh, random starts. And, uh, yeah, so w if you have the, the, the computing resource, so you, what you can do, you, for example, you generate 1,000 networks in parallel, each one with a different random start, and actually you just use the last one in the chain to actually to get your posterior sample, and you do model aversion across. I guess my, my concern is that those runs never talk to each other, right? So right. each run is done completely in isolation, and at the right. end you have your posterior distribution. Mm -hmm. but Okay. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks.